So what is customization of a motorcycle? I've had one or two doubting Thomases sending me emails telling me that you can't customize a motorcycle from a custom parts catalog. So I decided to do a little bit of research and just found out what the definition of a custom motorcycle is. And the most common definition that kept popping up is wedged to the effect, and I'll quote, a custom motorcycle is a motorcycle that has been cosmetically and or structurally changed in a way that makes it appear significantly different from the state it was in when it left the factory. Now, bearing that in mind, we live in very exciting times at the moment. Customising a bike used to be the preserve of a skilled artisan working in his garage or his shed. An expert with a cutting disc and welding equipment. Someone who had to fabricate every last piece of the conversion himself from scratch. Now this way of customising a bike is still very much alive and kicking and I have nothing but admiration for the people that are capable of producing that kind of work. But I don't have those kind of skills and I would imagine that most of the people that are watching this video also don't have those kind of skills. Now the custom parts industry has recognised this in recent years and people like Moto and Customs have taken all the hard work out of this for us to enable us to do something that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do. Now I think this kind of customization started a few years back with the Harley Davidsons but there is now a huge range of high quality precision made parts that you can buy off the shelf to really make your bike your own and that's what this series is setting out to prove. I'm not a mechanic, I'm just your average guy who is willing to have a go on a DIY basis and hopefully by the end of this series I will have proven that your average person with the ability to use a screwdriver, a spanner and a torque wrench can turn out something which is truly unique and desirable and something that you're proud to own and take pride in the fact that you built it yourself. Now when we got this bike we had no idea when the oil was last changed so really that was a priority and we're going to deal with that in this video today. But before we get on to that there are just one or two practical little add-ons that I want to go through just to make this bike a little bit more user friendly. Just a few cheap simple modifications that will get the ball rolling. Now, first of all, the way the seat is fitted on these old Bonnevilles has been a bone of contention for as long as they've existed. And to be quite honest, I don't think Triumph could have found a more inconvenient way of attaching the seat if they'd tried. The seat slides into place and locks in place by means of some tabs and sliders that are situated under the seat. But in order to actually secure it, Triumph came up with the idea of these two concealed Allen bolts that take about 10 minutes to get off and present a significant danger of scratching your rear mudguard while you're doing so. Now during general maintenance, whether it's cleaning or checking your battery, this seat will need to come off on a regular basis. And the inconvenient way of fastening it down that Triumph devised is just going to lead to neglect. So Motone came up with these extended bolts which can be operated by hand, there's no tools required. Like all of the Motone parts that I'm going to show you today, they're all CNC machined from aluminium billet. And in this case they're all black anodised with silver accents. They reduce the time it takes to remove your seat from minutes down to just a few seconds. designed to fit in with the contours of the bottom of the seat and looks so much better than Triumph's original solution. Likewise, Triumph's method of fastening the side panels onto the bike are just as inconvenient. It was initially a nice vintage touch, but in reality these coin operated turn screws that hold the side panels on make access to what's behind those panels far more difficult than it should be. Motown's replacement styled on similar lines to the extended seat fasteners take away the requirement for tools and make the job a lot easier and quicker than it used to be. In both cases they're not just functional, they're also designed to look good.
then we come to the fast idle adjuster on the side of those false carburettors. Again, another nice vintage touch in that it's meant to look like a choke knob even though it doesn't have a choke. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, but to tie in with those other two parts that we've just replaced, we felt that a common theme was appropriate. The original one is loctited in place, so you'll need a small spanner just to loosen it off. And then it's a quick and easy job just to re-loctite the new part in place. Now there is one more part that we're going to put on, but we're going to get the oil change out of the way, so here we go. Now we've got the chance here to do a sort of a, an experiment, just something to test a couple of theories that I've heard. Both the T100 and my T120 are in need of an oil change at the same time, so I've bought the materials in to do both of them. Now the general advice is that you should start the engine running for five minutes to allow the oil to warm up so that it, A, it will flow freer when you release it from the bike and b any particulate matter that is little particles of carbon that the oil has taken up during its life becomes mixed up and suspended in the full volume of the oil if it's left for a while it sinks to the bottom and causes a sludge at the bottom of the sump and the idea behind this is that this gets rid of most of the dirt during the oil change so you're not leaving so much of it in the engine now the other theory is that if you leave the bike and it hasn't been run for a month or so it's best just to drop the oil straight out of it without starting it up that way you will get a larger volume of oil out of the bike for the change because less of it's trapped in those little oil traps that are situated around the engine and you get a larger more complete oil change now the T120 hasn't been run for about a month so we're going to leave it that way and on Friday I'm going to do an oil change in Friday's video just to compare the two and see if there is any difference. Now obviously this is not really a scientific test because they're both completely different engines but I'm hoping it will give some indication as to what actually happens in those two different circumstances. Now I allowed the T100 to run for about five minutes and then remove the oil filler cap we won't be using this one again. Now let your exhaust pipes cool down before you start on the oil change because you don't want to burn yourself on them. Once they're cool enough to touch without causing injury to yourself, locate the sump drain plug which is situated at the front of the sump facing towards the front wheel. Put a suitable container underneath to catch the oil, crack it open and let it flow. Now to make both tests sort of equal here, I allowed the engine oil to drain from the sump for exactly one hour before I replaced the plug. Because the T120 only has a side stand, just to make sure I got the maximum amount of oil out of it, I put a couple of wooden blocks underneath the side stand after the first half hour just to level the bike out and make sure that any oil that was trapped was dislodged and allowed to flow out of the sump. If you want to be OCD about it, there's nothing to stop you from leaving this overnight to drain. But as a general rule of thumb, I think an hour's enough. It certainly won't get that amount of time if you're getting it serviced at your dealership. When it's drained, fit a new aluminium washer to your sump plug. Give the whole area where the sump plug fits on your sump a good clean with a dry rag to remove any grip from the mating surfaces and also to remove any drips that might later on cause you to believe that you've got a leak when actual fact you don't. Then replace your sump plug and torque it up to 25 newton meters. Now the oil changing procedure for a car or a bike is quite simple and straightforward. Literally anybody can do it. But if you're ever going to run into a snag, I can pretty much guarantee that that snag is going to involve removing the old oil filter. It seems to me that the worst culprits are dealerships. The T100 was last serviced at a Honda dealership and it did in fact have a Honda oil filter fitted but that's not the problem. They are just a generic fitted item. Now in their defence I think that dealerships do have a distinct worry over the legal implications of oil leaking out of the oil filter onto the back wheel and obviously the disastrous consequences that can cause and they nearly all seem to weigh over tighten them and in this case it was no exception 
Now I tried my usual oil filter removal tool on this and it was just having none of it. All it was doing was chewing into the metal on the canister and desperate times called for desperate measures. So as much as I dislike using this technique, I had to put a screwdriver through it in order to get some purchase on it so that I could actually loosen this oil filter off. And I must add that you should only do this as an absolute last resort. Now unfortunately I didn't film a lot of this procedure because I needed to get the camera out of the way so that I had room to work. Once you've got your old filter off, there will be some residual oil in the oil filter mounting point. Just leave it for 10 or 20 minutes for that to drain off while you get your new oil filter and your oil ready. Now if you have your bike serviced at a dealership you've got no choice they're going to use their own genuine filters. But if you're doing it yourself you do have a choice and my choice is high flow filters. Now just for the benefit of those who are thinking of leaving a comment saying that you should always use genuine filters, manufacturers of cars and motorcycles do not make their own oil filters or air filters. They design their engines to accept a generic proprietary filter model and they then go to a filter manufacturer to manufacture filters for their particular vehicle and during the manufacturing process that company's name is stamped on the filter. High flow filters are just about the biggest manufacturers worldwide of proprietary filters and that includes OEM filters. So the chances are if you're using a genuine filter supplied by the manufacturer of your vehicle you're already using a high flow filter. The big advantage is however that a high flow filter is about half the cost of an OEM filter. Now for the T100 and to make it simple for the T120 they both use the same filter. It's a HF204. The HF stands for high flow. If you buy a K&N filter it'll be a K&N204. I'm sure you get my drift. Now they do three versions all together. They do a racing version which I'm not going to go into because it doesn't apply in this instance. They do the standard black version and they also do a chrome plated sort of custom dress up version. And as this bike is going to be customised I decided I was going to go for the chrome version. Now motor oil. For both the older T100 and for the new Triumph T120, Triumph recommend a semi-synthetic or fully synthetic motor oil and in temperate regions that usually means a 10W40 grade. Now I know that motor oil is one of those subjects that seems to prompt everybody to climb up on the soapbox and start to preach about what oil you should be using. Silkaline is my choice and I won't go into any great detail here on this video but in Friday's video I will go in depth into my personal reasons for choosing Silkaline lubricants. Now I personally don't like to use semi-synthetic oils simply because there is no international or industry standard for what constitutes a semi-synthetic oil. A semi-synthetic oil can be half mineral based stock and half synthetic based stock or legally it can be 99% mineral based stock and 1% synthetic stock and I've never seen a manufacturer state on the carton, the tub, the bottle, whatever what ratio of mineral to synthetic stock is used in the manufacture of an individual oil. So for that reason I avoid it. I prefer to use a fully synthetic oil and for me it's got to be an ester based synthetic oil. Now ester based stock represents the highest quality synthetic based stock available for motor oils. It contains the best lubricating properties, the best resistance to high temperatures, it's scientifically proven to help engines run cooler by reducing friction but it's also the hardest synthetic lubricant to produce therefore it's the most expensive. Now there are other forms of synthetic base stock which are cheaper but they're not as effective and some of them are no better than mineral oil. So my advice is if you're going to buy a fully synthetic motor oil for your bike check to make sure that it is ester based, it will say on the container. 
Now, when it comes to an oil change, some people are quite content just to pour straight from the container that bought the oil in straight into the engine. But it is very difficult to gauge exactly how much you're pouring out. Now, if you don't put quite enough engine oil into your engine, you can always top it up, that's not a problem. But if you put too much oil into your engine, it can be a bit of a pain to get it out and bring it back down to the level that it's supposed to be at. So I always use a cheap measuring jug just to accurately measure how much oil that I'm putting into the engine so I don't overfill it. Now I always measure it a litre at a time. So to start off with, put a litre of oil into your measuring jug and use some of that first litre to charge your oil filter up. Pour it into the central hole of your oil filter to just below where the thread starts and then leave it for a few minutes. Now the oil filter is a mechanical filter, it contains a mechanical filter media and it will take some time for the oil to soak through that media into the outside part of the oil filter. What you'll notice over a 10 or 15 minute period is that the oil that you've poured into your oil filter, the level will drop. And just keep topping it up a little bit at a time until that oil level remains constant. Now the o-ring on high flow filters, the part which actually seals against the engine, is pre-greased. So strictly speaking this isn't necessary but it is always good practice just to get a little dab of the motor oil on the end of your finger and just gently smear it around the entire surface of the o-ring. This helps to make a better seal but more importantly it lubricates the o-ring to ensure that you can get it up to the correct tightness. Now Triumph say that this should be tightened up to 10 newton meters when it's fitted to the bike but I always prefer to put it on by hand and as a general rule of thumb screw it on until the two mating surfaces touch then when they touch just turn your oil filter one half turn. That's usually enough to affect a proper seal. Now I've used this method for years and I've only ever had one oil filter that did weep slightly after I'd fitted it and that was on a BMW. If that should happen, just tighten it up a little bit more. Generally speaking, if you go a full three quarter turn from the two surfaces touching, you've probably over tightened it and you might have trouble getting it off next time. So if necessary, just tighten it up fractionally. Don't lean on it too heavily. Again, before you fit it, make sure that you wipe all the mating surfaces on the underside of the engine to remove any grit or dirt and just to remove any spillages from when you actually took the old filter off. Again, the last thing you want is oil dripping down and you thinking that you've got a leak when in actual fact it's just the residue from the old filter. And once that's done, it's time to refill the engine. Now, the Triumph owner's manual for the T100 says that the engine has a total oil capacity of 4.5 litres, but that's for a dry fill, e.g. when the engine is new and totally empty of oil. But it also says that 3.8 litres is the amount required to refill the engine with an oil and filter change. So, working from that, I poured in three 1 litre jugs of oil and then fill the fourth jug up to the 400 milliliter mark. Now remember the sight glass on the T100 engine only gives an accurate oil level when the bike is upright and level. So why they've only put a side stand on it is a bit beyond me. So once again what I did here is I put a couple of offcuts of garden decking underneath the side stand. This brings the bike to an almost level position and I continued to gently pour in that remaining 400 millilitres of oil into the oil filler until it just touched the bottom indicator mark in the sight glass. Now it did effectively take the whole 400 millilitres so we still had a theoretical 400 millilitre deficit. So what I did at this point then is I put the oil filler cap back on, started the engine up and let it run for four or five minutes. After that the engine was switched off and I left the engine to settle and the oil level to build back up in the sight glass again for about 20 minutes, half an hour. After that I rechecked the level and found that it was actually higher than when I started. This is perfectly normal. Due to heat expansion you will always get a higher reading while the engine and the oil is warm than you will when it was cold. And for that reason, you should always take oil level readings when the engine is warm. Now, the remaining 400 millilitres of oil took it up to 
more or less bang on the maximum level I was quite happy with that and that's a job well done I will say that since I got this bike uh, there was initially a problem with the oil which I will mention in Friday's video and when I've checked the oil level on this bike it has always been just above the minimum level in the window so in reality although I've put the stated 3.8 litres of oil into the engine on the refill I think what I actually dropped out of the engine was a bit less than that so finally the bit that you've all been waiting for yes you've guessed it it's a replacement oil filler cap from Motone Customs now this is actually the same design oil filler cap that I fitted on the T120 some months ago albeit on this occasion it's a black anodized version with a silver center if you've got a T100 and it still has the original oil filler cap fitted you'll know how awkward they are to use and this is the perfect replacement as you would expect really high quality CNC machined out of aluminium billet it's a nice chunky design that's easy to get on and off with the facility of that allen key socket in the center just so you can nip it up a little bit tighter to make sure no one pinches it now one thing you will find that might be a little bit worrying when you first get one of these is that the o-ring that seals it when it's fitted does actually come in a separate little packet inside the box now when you first try to fit this it does have a habit of falling off so what I recommend you do is just take a little dab of engine oil on the end of your finger rub it all the way around that o-ring and then press it into place on the cap screw it quite tightly into your engine oil filler that will compress it and fix it in place and trust me it will never fall out again it's a nice looking piece I've certainly been very pleased with the one that I've got on the T120 and as you can see there's a bit of a dark thing going on here in general because some of the other parts that Moton have sent through are also mainly black powder coated or anodized alloy pieces so that was episode 2 episode 3 coming up in two weeks time in episode 3 we're going to be looking at correcting that nasty little piece of rust on the framework down at the bottom front of the bike we're also going to be fitting a sump guard and finishing off with a short shift gear lever don't miss it now i hope you've enjoyed this first proper episode where we've actually got to grips with doing some stuff with the bike if anybody's got some suggestions on how you'd like to see the format presented in the future please don't hesitate to leave a comment i hope you've enjoyed this video and it has inspired you i will leave a link in the video description for all of the products that i've shown you today please leave a like and subscribe to the channel as i said i'm back on friday with an oil change on the t120 so we'll see what difference these two methods make what i will say is that we did have a partial failure of the genuine triumph oil filter something you need to look out for so don't miss it thanks again for watching and i'll see you on friday